Hello and welcome to our Groundwater Lectures. In this series of videos, we're going to be talking about groundwater, what it is, where to find it, how it moves. We're also going to look at some of the problems that come along with it, including pollution and hazards that come along with our overuse of it. So groundwater is part of the water cycle. And in this course, we're going to be looking some at groundwater and some at uh, water at the surface, particularly in streams and during floods. But they're all part of a big interconnected system. So it's kind of hard for us to really look at them separately because they do interact so much. And you're going to see some of that overlap here in just a minute. All right, so what is groundwater? A lot of people have this kind of strange idea of groundwater being in these really big like underground holes or caverns, stuff in like a gas tank. We're kind of used to uh, gas stations storing their gasoline underground. Um, but that's not really how groundwater works. Although good news, it really is just water we find underground. All right, so here is one of my very favorite analogies ever. Congratulations. All right, so we have a sonic cup here. But darn, what in the world does groundwater have to do with Sonic? Well, I like going to Sonic um, to get drinks, mainly because they have that awesome crunchy ice. So we're going to talk about ice here for a second. All right, so you pull up at the Sonic to get yourself a drink, and you order yourself a Route 44 Dr. Pepper, because it's always Dr. Pepper. And they say, we are offering a very special deal today. We know it is Arizona. We know it is really hot and your ice melts super fast and waters your Dr. Pepper down. And that's just sad. So we're offering a special deal here at, a deal here at Sonic today. Um, and you get a choice between two different types of ice. So type number one is the normal Sonic ice. Type number two is one giant ice cube. And this way, it will melt a whole lot slower and it will not water down your Dr. Pepper quite as fast. So which one of these are you going to choose? Well, hopefully, you probably said the regular old Sonic Ice because you're not likely to get just a whole lot of Dr. Pepper if there's one giant ice cube in there. Um, so... What I want you to think of when we talk about groundwater is imagine this ice that's in your cup. Your cup is like sand and gravel. It's just little pieces of sediment. All right. So they put ice in your cup. What comes next? <gasps> the Dr. Pepper. So when we add Dr. Pepper to the cup, does it sit at the top right above the ice? Does it go all the way down to the very bottom and just push all that ice up through the top? Well, no, not not really. It fills in the spaces between those ice cubes. So when we're thinking about groundwater, the Dr. Pepper here is the water, the groundwater that is between the little pieces of sand and gravel that we can find in the ground. Now, obviously, what do we need next? Yeah, we're going to need a straw. All right. So when you stick that straw in there, where, where's the Dr. Pepper in the straw? Does it fill the whole straw up and just kind of sit at the top? Does it wait at the very bottom of the straw until you actually start getting a drink? Well, no. I mean, it, it's basically at the exact same level as the Dr. Pepper in the cup, right? Well, this is what uh, so in this case, your straw is a water well, and that level of Dr. Pepper is what we call the water table. But of course, there's more here. Um, so in your cup of Dr. Pepper, does that level of Dr. Pepper in your cup and your straw ever change? Well, yeah, right? If you drink it, the water, the Dr. Pepper goes down. So when the Dr. Pepper goes down um, in a groundwater system, we call this discharge or withdrawal. Um, and so that's when water is leaving the system and that can make the water table go down. Does your Dr. Pepper ever go up? Well, maybe. 
if you get a refill, but they don't really do that at Sonic, right? Um, but when the water table goes up, we're adding water into this system, and that is called recharge or infiltration. Um, and what you see in our little GIF here is all the water working its way down to the to the water table and filling up the water. All right, so let's look at a real groundwater system here and not just a sonic cup, but darned if it doesn't work pretty well. So at the top here, we have a, what's called the zone of soil moisture. Um, it's kind of a mouthful. Unfortunately, we are in Arizona right now, and we don't have much of this because we are in a desert environment. But if you go to like a normal place um, and you dig in the dirt, it's the soil and the dirt right at the surface is going to be just, just a little wet, just a little moist. Um, and that's a lot because of the plants. That's because the soil can hold some moisture, but there's not just a whole lot. All right, down below that, we have what's called the unsaturated zone or the Veda zone. So this is that ice at the top of your cup that's above the Dr. Pepper. Now, it's not that it's completely devoid of Dr. Pepper because you can see like little bits of brown liquid kind of clinging onto a few of those ice cubes. But for most of the Dr. Pepper that's in that part of the cup, it is busy working its way down. And it is headed down to the zone of saturation. This is also known as the phreatic zone, but this, this is where you find your groundwater. Um, so it's nice and soggy down there. And of course, this line that separates the zone of saturation between the unsaturated zone, the very top surface of the zone of saturation, this is our water table. Um, and that water table is going to be really, really important for us in terms of looking at the health of a groundwater system. So in most cases, Arizona is obviously a, uh, an exception because it always is, but in most cases, your water table is going to sort of roughly follow the shape of the topography of the land. So you can see on the left side of this diagram, H1 is where a mountain is. So the topography is higher and the water table is higher there. But as you go to the right, you go down in a valley. So the water table drops down. And then there's a hill, so the water table goes back up again. What's something sort of interesting to note here, though, is what? So groundwater is water that's underground, but what happens where the water table is actually above the surface in these images? You see that pond on the right? So when you have natural lakes or natural ponds, the top of the water in the pond represents the water table, um, which is pretty cool, actually. Um, so you can see sort of the shape of the water table. If you have a whole bunch of natural lakes or natural ponds, you can look at the elevation of the surface of the lake to determine kind of what the groundwater system is doing there. So if we go to somewhere that has a really shallow water table, it's very, very close to the surface. Um, what happens is if you were to dig a hole, you would reach the water table pretty easily and it fills up with water. And so Florida has lots and lots of natural lakes. Um, this particular area is really well known for them. This is Winter Haven, which tells you a little bit about who, uh, who, uh, first or why this whole little town is here, right? Um, I liked down at the, the little bit south of there is the little town of Frostproof. What do you notice about all of these lakes, though? They all sort of seem to have something in common. Yeah, they're all pretty round. Is that weird? Now, we can assume snowbirds who are retiring to Florida just really, really like round lakes. Um, but unfortunately for the people that are there, that's actually completely natural lakes. Um, and it's round because those are sinkholes. And we're going to look at sinkholes in another video. But we're going to look um, look at how they form and where they form here in a little bit. All right. So if natural lakes tell us where the groundwater table is, what about Arizona? How many natural lakes are there in Arizona? So you maybe think of 
in the town lake, which is <laughs> completely held in by a dam on either side. Um, you may think of Roosevelt Lake. You may think of like Pleasant. You may think Canyon Lake, Swarrow Lake, Roosevelt Lake, Lake Mead and Lake Powell. But all of those are created by dams on rivers. For the most part, it's actually used um, to create a reservoir for water storage. So what, how many lakes do we have that are completely natural here in Arizona? Spoiler alert, there's two. Yeah, there's only two natural lakes in all of Arizona. Now where those are, they're actually pretty close to each other. So you can see if we zoom in up on the rim just a little bit, right at the edge of the uh, Magillan Rim, um, we can see Mormon Lake, which is at the kind of northeastern corner of the image here, and Stoneman Lake, which is in the south center. Um, what you probably don't notice here is just a whole lot of water. <laughs> um, I often joke that it should be called Mormon Mud Puddle because that's about all it is most of the time. Um, but if these are our only natural lakes in all of Arizona, what does that tell us about the water table? Yeah, so the water table is not very close to the surface. For the most part, the water table is actually pretty deep. And we're going to look at some numbers to see how far you have to dig down to hit water. In some places in southern Arizona, you've got to dig for a while. And a lot of this is just because we are a desert in a very arid environment, which means our water table tends to be really deep. And we don't have much surface water at all. Now, do all rocks and sediments have water in them? If I just go anywhere outside with my shovel and start digging a hole, am I going to hit water? Well, no. <laughs> um, to hold groundwater, rocks and sediments have to have two very specific properties. So property number one is called porosity. So this is a word you should probably know because you're going to be using it throughout the class. So porosity is the percentage of a rock or sediment that consists of pore spaces. So in this case, we can measure it with a number. Um, and in this case, we, we use percentages a lot of the time to describe that. So it mentions pore spaces. What, what are pore spaces? What do you think of when you hear the word pore? Maybe uh, that you need to exfoliate your skin, right? So the pores in your skin are little bitty holes. Um, and those pores in rocks and sediments, those are just little holes that exist in between the grains of um, sediment. Or we're going to look at how some rocks have porosity as well. I'm sorry, I thought this was funny, so I had to add it in because they are... Uh, they're Yellowstone by one of the geysers, and it says that steam is good for your complexion, and then ask how the pores are doing. All right, so this is a great little demo that shows porosity. Um, and so you can see that this greenish fluid gets poured into a beaker. And you can see where the water fills in those little spaces in between the rocks. Now, the rocks don't go anywhere, um, but the water, which I'm assuming it is here, is just replacing the air that's in between those holes. So the more holes you have, the higher the porosity. Um, so what does that really look like? So in sediment, so things, sediment's just like, pieces of rocks that aren't glued together. So in this case, your porosity is mainly because of the void spaces that are left between where they don't quite touch very well. And the picture on the left here, though, you can see there's pretty kind of, you know, big round 
maybe pebbles. But in between all of those are some smaller ones taking up that those holes. And that doesn't leave just a whole lot of room for water to fill in. Um, if it were just those big rocks, that would give you a whole lot more space. On the right is a rock with fractures. And this is a really easy way to sort of open up some holes for water to sink in um, into rocks that don't generally have holes on their own. Now, remember how I said that groundwater isn't really like, you know, lakes sloshing around underground? Well, there actually are places where this happens, but it's not very common. So one way to get porosity is in limestone caves, because as we're going to talk about when we talk about sinkholes, limestone is full of the mineral calcite. And when calcite um, meets up with a little bit of acid, it starts to dissolve and it leaves these big holes underground and we call those caverns and we uh, go on trips and go down and visit them, which is pretty cool. And this particular cavern, you can see there's actually water running through it. And so again, that top of the water you see here in the picture is totally the water table. So here's a nice little, little uh, graph for you. I happen to like these. And once you can see, is that volcanic rock really spans a lot of porosity, but a really fractured volcanic rock can have almost 50% porosity, which is pretty, uh, um, pretty impressive. And you can see limestone with cavernous opening, those can have just about as much. But as we go down, you can see that gravel's got quite a bit, sand, and then silt and clay is really, really high in porosity, except, I'm going to show you why this silt and clay doesn't work very well, though, for storing water. So there's another property called permeability. And permeability is the ability to transmit fluid. So like our uh, handsome gentleman here, usually I, I mention the word permeate, as in the smell permeated the room. Well, that means it's kind of, you know, moving through if somebody's over by the door and farts, um, the people over there are going to smell it first, but then little by little, the further you get away from the door, the more and more people are going to notice it because that fluid, which in this case is a gas, is moving through the room. Um, and water needs to be able to move through the rocks and sediments um, to really hold groundwater and to be able to uh, act as a system for us. Um, so here's a really kind of cool GIF I found as well. Um, but this is neat because it's a permeable concrete. So what you can see is they're dumping water out in the parking lot and it is soaking right into the ground. Um, this is actually probably a really important step to be able to take because concrete blocks water from getting to the ground. And this causes a lot of... Uh, drop in the groundwater table because you don't get the same recharge when things are covered in uh, concrete. So this is kind of cool. Here's some great little gifs too. So here's a new word you may not know, loam. Um, it's a type of soil. I actually had to look it up because I'm not a, a soil person, but a loam is equal mixes of sand and silt and a little bit of clay mixed in. So sand, Think about going to the beach. Um, silt is a little bit smaller than that. It's probably going to feel really soft in your hand, but if it gets like blown in your face, like during a uh, dust storm, it's all gritty, still like on your face and in your teeth, between your teeth. Um, and then clay is really, really fine grained. It's much more like flour. Um, when it gets wet, it feels all kind of weird and gooey. And we're going to talk about clays a lot more when we get to li um, land sites. So what you can see here is they're just pouring water in all of these. And you can see that the water moves quite a bit faster through this sandy loam than any of the other ones, which tells us that sandy loam has a higher permeability. And so here are you some examples of some permeability. And what you should notice is we see that limestone and the fractured volcanic rock right over here at pretty high hydraulic conductivity. So this is a way of measuring how fast 
the uh, water is able to move through it, which is a measure of permeability. And if we look down at the bottom, though, um, gravel actually has a super high con hydraulic conductivity. So it's really permeable. Things move easily through it. Sand, not as much. But if you remember, sand actually had a higher porosity all the way down to those clays. So clays had a really high porosity, sometimes as much as 70%. So it's a lot of holes. But unfortunately, the water can't move between those holes very quickly or very easily. And so it has a really low permeability. So let's put these together. An aquifer is a formation, and just like we see on geologic maps, those are formations. It's a formation or a group of formations or part of a formation that contains sufficient saturated permeable material to yield significant quality quantities of water to wells and springs. So an aquifer is basically a layer of rock underground or sediment um, that both has a high enough porosity to saturate with the water and a high enough permeability that that water is able to move through it. So that when you drill a hole down, if you, if you dig a hole deep enough down to that water table, the water fills in the hole you, you dug, and that's basically what a water well is. Um, but what it needs to have, because the permeability needs to be high, is that if you were to take that water out, you need that water to flow through the rocks to be able to refill the well you just dug. So what makes a good aquifer then? Well, if you notice over here in our solid rocks, um, limestone. Limestone uh, makes pretty darn good aquifer. Um, and also that fractured volcanic rock, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, so you can see those are sort of your best shots in terms of solid rocks. And if we go down here to the unconsolidated material, remember that silt and clay had a high porosity, but not so much permeability. But that sand and gravel is sort of in that, that middle sweet spot where they work really, really nicely as well. So those are the kind of things you're going to be aiming for if you're looking to find an aquifer. Well, we've been talking about water moving through sediment. Are there types of rocks or sediment that actually stops groundwater from flowing? Well, there's a couple of types. So there is what we call an aquitard. Um, and it totally makes sense. I know it sounds totally like un -PC, um, But aqua means water. And in music, a retard means you slow down. So in this case, it's something that slows down water. And this is exactly what's happening. So in the GIF, you can see that the water flows pretty easily through the loam on top, and it still flows through the sand beneath it, but it's not moving quite as fast. All right, so just a little lower permeability, and it slows things down a little bit, but there are layers that completely stop groundwater from flowing, um, and it's a completely impermeable layer. You can see in this video that it's labeled clay, and you're going to find that clays make really, really nice impermeable layers. Um, it's going to come back to us when we talk about landslides, because what happens is if you, you look at this GIF, um, all the layers are nice and horizontal, but if you imagine something on the right side, raising that right side up and tilting those layers over a little bit, that layer of clay is going to start to become dangerous because the groundwater pools on top of it and water has some buoyancy. And also the clay, when it gets wet, actually gets really slippery. Um, and those two things put together are one of the kind of perfect storms for having landslides. So this is a map of aquifers throughout the United States. There's quite a few of them. Um, but if you notice, there's kind of a big one, right smack dab in the middle here of the United States. This is called the Ogallala Aquifer. It's one of the largest that we have. Um, in the United States, and you can see a lot of Nebraska um, and lots of little bits of a bunch of other states. 
Um, and this map sort of shows you the outline of it, but keep in mind that that's like underground. So it's not like you can see it at the surface, but you can detect it under there. If you think about Nebraska, Kansas, these parts of the country, that is all agricultural. And they grow a lot of corn up in Nebraska. Um, corn fields, wheat fields, some of the most important crops that we have in the United States. But they don't get a lot of water. Now, if we look, I'm, this is zoomed in to somewhere only on the Ogallala Aquifer. I'm sorry, I forget where I actually pulled this from, but I took it right off of, of Google Earth. It's kind of cool. It's like some kind of pop culture painting, right? But this is what the ground looks like. It's just circles and Pac-Man. That's not natural at all. Um, so if we zoom in, this is what one, just one of those circles looks like. And you can see the crops, the rows of the crops kind of aligned um, east-west in the picture here. And there's a definite like line that's making almost a pipe chart look to this. If we keep zooming in, that's what it looks like in the very, very middle. Um, and what this is, is actually what is known as a central pivot irrigation system. It's a pic, this is a picture of one from Arizona, actually. So this is not, uh, Ogallala Aquifer is not the only place that this gets used. Um, this is a fairly um, easy way to water a whole lot of crops. So it's a center pivot. They're really, really long. One side is in the middle of the field and they turn it on and those wheels turn and it just goes around and around and around in circles. And that leaves those beautiful circular shapes and circular fields there, which is kind of neat. Now, 90% of the water in the Ogallala Aquifer is going to crops, just like this, irrigation for agricultural purposes. And that's a lot of water. Um, but if you think about, if you've ever been to the panhandle of Texas or the panhandle of Oklahoma, it's really, really dry. And so the fact that this is a region that is so um, heavy in agriculture is sort of surprising based on the amount of rainfall they get. Um, for instance, southwest Kansas actually only gets 18 inches of rain a year, but they need that water for those sort of thirsty crops. And so what's happening is the water from the Ogallala Aquifer is getting used up. There is a lot of withdrawal from the aquifer, not just a whole lot of recharge. Now, Arizona has aquifers as well. We are down here in southern Arizona in those lovely orange basin and range fill, uh, basin fill aquifers. Um, so basin and range basically is this region of southern Arizona and a large part of the southwest of the United States. Um, there's some in New Mexico, most of Nevada, a little bit of southern California. So this is an area that's um, bounded by faults. And what happened is when these faults moved, you had these big mountain ranges that stayed nice and high and these basins or valley, like we're here in, in the Phoenix Valley, that dropped down. And over time, that basin where it drops down is filled up with sediment, lots and lots of loose gravel. And that's where we find those aquifers. So if you were to go to South Mountain and start digging, that's all things like granite and some metamorphic rocks that have no porosity whatsoever so you're not going to get any groundwater there but out here in the in the middle of the valley when you get a far away from those mountains you do find those aquifers down there and we're going to look at some of the problems that come along with using those aquifers as we move through all right so that is the uh conclusion to the very first part of this lecture. Hopefully things are clear. If you have any questions, something that wasn't clear, make sure you let me know. Thanks.